Hi, and welcome to chapter three of the seven part series concerning stand. Uh, it is in the previous two chapters that we looked at greed and generosity as a principal virtue. We looked at uh, pride and humility as the principal virtue. And uh, I want to really encourage you at this time that you have now looked at these two and have you practiced the virtue? Because knowing book knowledge or content knowledge will not be life changing. It is at the time of application that we see these uh, concepts become real. So uh, I really want to encourage you that when you look at uh, pride and humility that you practice humility. When we look at greed and generosity that you practice generosity. I want to re-remind you as well that we are following a calendar and we believe that God has purposefully told us or given us the mandate as to when or at what time we are to listen to these specific chapters. And I really want to encourage you to do so. Today, we are looking at the principle or, or the vice, the deadly sin of jealousy. Listen to James 3 verse 14 to 16 in the English Standard Version. It says the following, it says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. So James is saying, hey, be real. If you have jealousy and selfish ambition, acknowledge it. Do not be false to the truth. Verse 15 says, this is not the wisdom that comes, from, from da comes down from above. Say that again. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual. And this is where I want to make a big exclamation mark. It is demonic. Verse 15 says, this is not the wisdom that comes from the, down from above, but it is earthly, it is unspiritual, and it, it is demonic. Verse 16 says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. I want to stress what the word says here, that demonic activity leading to every vile practice can be coupled back to jealousy be careful if you look at churches today that is exactly what happens when churches split when people take offenses when people uh, in the context of healthy relationships see these relationships deteriorate and come under attack you can normally trace it back to jealousy where people started to see someone else and uh, see them succeed or see them receive and they start to experience something in their hearts surrounding this idea of jealousy. They start to covet and want what they don't have. If only I could have your wife. If only I could have your car. If only I could have your job. If only I could have what you have, then I would be happy. And this jealous spirit takes hold of our hearts and we see our lives consumed by it. And we see destruction start to progressively happen. Now I look at the principal virtue. Because remember we said that we don't want to focus on the vice. We refuse to not acknowledge it. We refuse to act like it doesn't exist. I mean even James says here uh, in verse 14. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast and be false to the truth. So be real. But now when we focus on the virtue, we see that the parallel virtue running with jealousy is gratitude, an attitude of gratitude. Listen to Exodus 20 verse 17. It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. What does this tell us? This is a timeless problem. It is not coupled to a generation or a specific time in history. Being jealous has come from the very beginning. Why? It's part of human nature. People get entangled in the idea of I need what you have so I can be happy. This is false. This is a lie and it is sown by the enemy to keep your focus on having more, receiving more, 
but normally it's wanting what someone else has. Listen to this quote by Kevin Gary Smith. He says, if we are not content with what we have, listen, if we are not happy, content with what we have, we shall not be content with what we want. In other words, if we are not going to be happy with the things we already possess, if that is not enough for us, at no point having the car or the wife or the money of someone else, we all of a sudden experience joy and happiness. It doesn't work that way. Enough is never enough. So even when you receive someone else's, uh, when you pursue someone's wife, their life, the moment you receive it, you are still discontent. You are still not grateful because the problem was never having this particular thing. The problem originated within the heart around the vice of jealousy. Now we can always find something to be grateful for. I want to encourage you and stress this, that you do not need to have something that you wanted all your life. And when you get this, then you can be grateful to God. Listen, if your gratitude is not coupled first to the idea that you were lost, and God saved you, unmerited favor. You do not deserve His grace. You do not deserve His mercy. You do not deserve the fact that Jesus died for you, that God came from heaven to earth, sacrificed His Son, hung Him on a cross, allowed Him to receive the burden of everybody's sin in this world, take it upon Himself and die the death of the worst sinner in history. So that me and you can live freely and live the scripture that says who the son has set free is free indeed if that is not your primary source of gratitude i want to bring you back to your salvation and tell you that even in the midst of the biggest challenges you might be facing you can always be grateful for the fact that you are saved that you are his child that god loves you and it is the untangibles, the things we cannot pick up, behold, that we should be grateful for the most. Because those are the things that have eternal value. Where anything else we can seek to receive on this earth can only be had for a time. In other words, uh, I can receive the Ferrari or the, the, the BMW or the Mercedes, whatever it is, but I can only experience it for a time on earth. So how can I believe that true contentment can come from, from having things? Rather, the Bible tells us to store up our tre treasures in heaven where moth and dust does not corrode and destroy. Why? Because they are eternal treasures. And it is these eternal treasures we want to be grateful for most. So again, I stress that we can always find something to be grateful for. And I encourage you that long before you go before the God and petition to God, Lord, Lord, I need a new car. Lord, please give me a bigger house. Lord, please give me another wife. Whatever it is, long before you do that, go before God and say, Lord, thank you for my salvation. I am grateful for your blood. I am grateful for the Holy Spirit, my comforter, my friend, the one who is always with me. Lord, thank you that you said you would never leave me or forsake me. Thank you that you love me, that you know the amount of hairs on my head. And you can carry on scripture after scripture, finding things you can be grateful for. Now, parents, you know that when you approach, when your child approaches you with this heart of gratitude, you always and I mean always, with, when it's within your means, want to bless them more. Isn't that the case? When we see our children come to us and say, Dad, Mom, thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you so much for everything you sacrifice for me. Thank you so much for every area that you want me to excel. What do you want to do as a parent? Even more. How can I do something more for this wonderful child filled with gratitude? On the other hand, as a parent, how do you feel when you are really trying to give your child the best and they say, ah, you know what, mom, dad, thanks a lot for what you do, but really is that the best you have? 
or thank you very much for my new shoes or new clothes, but come on, did you really have to go buy it at this place? Come on, is this the best you have? I need more, I want more, 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 more. What is your heart as a parent? You might give heavy heartedly, or you might not give at all and think, come on, have I raised a brat? Have I raised an ungrateful? And these are the, the ideas that start channeling through our head. Now, it's not at this time that I want to uh, couple our emotions to God. God is God. He is sovereign. He doesn't get angry and upset because I've stepped on his toes. But I'm trying to convey a message here. And the message is that when we are grateful, chances are when we are in the state of gratefulness and thankfulness, that we will continue to receive. But when we go to the other side and we start becoming discontent with this life, and as Kevin Gary Smith said, we, we become, we, we enter into this attitude of, uh, if I can have this and this, then I'll be happy. I, I want to tell you that you're in a dangerous place then. Because you can never be content with receiving. But a state of contentment is achieved when we see what we already have, what God has already done for us, and we, he, he is taking us. So uh, the challenge for us today, as we end this, this chapter on, on uh, jealousy and gratitude, is that I want you to take some time out today, somewhere, and start telling God everything you are thankful for. Start going from, from scripture to scripture, looking at your life. God, thank you for my health. Thank you for my family. Thank you for, for food. Thank you for a house. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. And I want you to start getting into a culture where your prayers don't start with God, please give me, but God, thank you for. And when you do this, I want you to start journaling how much change you experience in a change of attitude. When you start becoming grateful, how much your life, your very existence, benefits to the positive.